Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in February of 1993, I flew from New Jersey, where I was uh, going to school for seminary, to Los Angeles, and I was uh, coming here to be interviewed by the Board of Ordained Ministry. Uh, yes, it was a culmination of a year-long process to see whether or not I was fit to become an ordained pastor in the United Methodist Church. Well, the interviews were being held at Holy Spirit Retreat Center in Encino, California. Let me tell you, I was super nervous. Now, I'm a confident guy in general, but I was really nervous. Uh, this would be the biggest interview of my life. And there were nine people on the interview team, a combination of both lay people and clergy. The interview lasted, I think it was between two and three hours long. Uh, they could ask, interview me on any uh, type of questions. I'd already turned in a bunch of written work, so it was like follow-up questions about theology, pastoral care, worship, preaching, United Methodist doctrine, history, whatever it was. They, they could ask any questions. And when it was over, I was invited to go outside while they decided they would vote on whether or not I would be ordained that year. Well, I don't want to brag or anything, but I'm expecting this to be about a five-minute discussion. I'm outside just kind of taking in, you know, the beautiful air. And, and they would uh, quickly, you know, vote me up. They would sing the Alu Chorus. They would say, man, it's amazing we have someone this talented that wants to be a pastor in our denomination. 20 minutes later, I was starting to get a little bit worried. Like, how long does it take to vote yes for me to be ordained? Uh, 30 minutes later, I, I started having this deep sense of dread. Could I have failed? No, it's not possible. 35 minutes of standing outside, they finally called me back in. And the lead uh, person of the team, the first thing he said to me was, Jim, we've decided to recommend you for ordination. I'm like, yes. And then he quickly added, but I want you to know it wasn't unanimous. Oh, and so this is what I heard. Oh, rejected. <laughs> right? I mean, I was going to be ordained, but it, like, wh who didn't like me? How, how is that possible? And it really bothered me. In fact, it took me like a couple of years to kind of work uh, through this idea that not everybody loved me, especially when it came to wanting me to be a pastor. Author Eugene Peterson, in his book on the life of David, Leap Over a Wall, writes this. It always comes as something of a shock that not everyone likes us just the way we are. We're criticized, teased, avoided, attacked, shot at, abandoned, stoned, cursed, hunted down, snubbed, stabbed in the back, treated like a doormat, and damned with faint praise. Now, not all of these sayings and not all of the time, but enough of them and often enough to realize that not everyone shares God's excellent attitude toward us. I <laughs> love that quote. Welcome to the fourth week in our summer sermon series entitled, After God's Own Heart, The Life of David. We're, we're examining the life of one of the most beloved characters in all of the Hebrew scriptures, and that, of course, is King David. Each week, we're looking at one of his significant relationships, and we began with Samuel and David being uh, anointed by God. Uh, then we moved on to Goliath and defeating the, the Philistine champion. We examined last week his deep friendship with Jonathan, and today we're going to look at the very tumultuous relationship between David and Saul, the first king of Israel. Now, we're going to begin today's sermon a little later in the story than what Donnie read a few minutes ago. We're going to begin here in this area of the Middle East. It's the En Gedi Oasis on the western shores of the Dead Sea. Numerous springs feed into this canyon, making it a refuge for humans and animals alike. Cliffs over 2,000 feet tall rise from the coastline, topped by tablelands. The limestone cliffs are deeply grooved by erosion, making it a tangle of canyons and caves. And it's precisely these cliffs that I want us to focus on for a moment this morning. Now, you'll notice from this picture that uh, the cliffs are pockmarked with caves, and it was this cave or something quite similar in this region that we find King David at the start of where I want to pick us up in the story today. 
This is where David has been forced to live. No royal palaces anymore for this would-be king. No uh, comforts of a nice soft bed to sleep in. No sumptuous tables overflowing with the choicest of wines and the riches of food. No, David has been forced to now hide out in caves in the En Gedi. 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 to 2. <clears throat> when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness of the En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men of all Israel and went to look for David and his men in the direction of the rocks of the wild goats. And I have to imagine that David hanging out here in these cliffs had to have thought about how his life had changed so recently. I mean, ever since the great prophet Samuel visited him in Bethlehem years ago, man, his life was on the fast track to success. He, he was anointed by God. He defeated the champion Goliath. And being invited then to become one of the family with King Saul to live in the royal palace, he came about halfway into Saul's 42 reign as king of Israel. He became one of the youngest commanders of the Israelite army. He married the king's daughter. Life was good until it wasn't. Until Saul literally went out of his mind, as we shall see. Author Gene Edwards, in his monumental book, A Tale of Three Kings, reminds us just how special King Saul was back in the day. He writes... Saul was one of the greatest figures in human history. He was a farm boy, a country kid who made good. He was tall, good-looking, and well-liked. He was baptized into the spirit of God. He also came from a good family. In his lineage were some of the greatest historical figures of all humanity. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, all were his ancestors. Saul united a people and founded a kingdom. Few men have ever done that. He created an army out of thin air. He won battles in the power of the Lord, defeated the enemy again and again as few men have ever done. He was also eaten with jealousy, filled with self-importance, and willing to live in spiritual darkness. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the chapter that Donnie read for us this morning, chapter 18. Shortly after David has been invited to come and live with the king and his family in the royal palace. 1 Samuel 18, 10 and 11. The next day, an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had a spear in his hand and Saul threw the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. As time goes on, Saul convinces himself that David isn't just here to, to play music for him. No, he's out to steal the throne, to become the next king. Though David never makes any moves towards that at all when he's in the presence of the king. In fact, the fact of the matter is the presence of God has left Saul, says the narrator in the story, in favor of David. And everything that Saul tries to do to reverse that, to get God's blessing back in his life absolutely backfires on him. Now, I want to come back to this little book, A Tale of Three Kings. And when I first stumbled on it about a decade or so ago, I was struck by, it's a small book. You could read it easily in a, in a couple of hours. But I was struck by how profound and spiritually challenging it was. The subtitle is, I don't know if you can see it on the, on the screen, uh, A Study in Brokenness. Early in his book, Edward says that our lives have to be mixed lavishly with pain, sorrow, and crushing in order for God's seed to fully take root. He indicates that God wants people who are willing to live in pain, that God wants broken vessels, which I figured is something nobody wants to sign up for, right? Who wants to sign up for living in pain and struggles? But David, says Edwards, was enrolled not in the lineage of royalty, but into the school of brokenness. And then he says this, and Saul was God's chosen way to crush David. How does that grab you? 
right? No, no one wants to think that God may have a plan, a, 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 a hand to play in the pain and suffering that we experience in this life. But then to think that some of the people that are in our lives, the, some of those people that give us the most headaches, the most heartbreak, the most stress, maybe that they are actually instruments of God placed in our life for a purpose. Wow, that is hard to wrap your head around, isn't it? What do you do when someone throws a spear at you? It's a great question, right? Whether you're talking about this story in the life of David or whether it's our own stories. Have you had spears thrown at you by others? Sometimes others who are supposed to be on our side? Edwards writes, when someone throws a spear at you, David, just wrench it out of the wall and throw it back. Everyone else does. You can be sure. And in performing this small feat of returning thrown spears, you will prove many things. One, you are courageous. Two, you stand for the right. Three, you boldly stand against the wrong. Four, you are tough and you can't be pushed around. You will not stand for injustice and unfair treatment. You are the defender of the faith, the keeper of the flame, the detector of all heresy. You will not be wronged. All of these attributes then combine to prove that you are also a candidate for kingship. Yes, perhaps you are the Lord's anointed after the order of King Saul. Now, throughout the book, Edwards repeatedly contrasts the order of King Saul and the order of King David. And you see, the problem is that none of us can tell who is the Lord's anointed and who is not. No one knows the answer, only God. And Edward says, and God isn't telling. Edward posits that David, the shepherd, would have grown up to become King Saul II if it were not for this one thing. That God cut away the Saul that was inside of David's heart. Hear that again. David would have grown up to have been King Saul number two had not God cut away the Saul that was inside David's own heart. It was an operation, Edward says, which took years and was a brutalizing experience that almost killed David. David did not know what to do when a spear was thrown at him. He did not throw Saul's spears back at him, nor did he make any spears of his own and throw them. Something was different about David. All he did was dodge spears. And then Edwards finishes this section by saying this. You can tell easily when someone has been hit by a spear because he or she turns a deep shade of bitter. Do you know anyone that's been hit by a spear? Maybe you've been hit by a spear or two over the course of your life from family members or colleagues or those who were supposedly friends. The challenge for us is to learn from David, who is all about dodging the spears. Former President Jimmy Carter, in his inspirational book, Sources of Strength, comments that the, the bitterness and jealousy of King Saul had three significant effects on his life. First, it blinded him to David's true nature. Now, although David had been anointed by Samuel to be king, he had no ambition to take over the throne at this moment in his life. He never did or said anything that indicated he was ready to become the next king of Israel. He was simply interested in serving his king, his nation, and his God. 100% completely. Carter writes, David's behavior is one of the most remarkable demonstrations of loyalty and humility anywhere in the Bible. Yet Saul, driven nearly insane by jealousy, is completely unable to recognize it. The bitterness and jealousy blinded Saul to David's true nature. Second, Saul's jealousy destroyed the joy of his own accomplishments as king. I mean, Saul was the undisputed leader of Israel. It was uh, all of the military victories as the commander-in-chief of the army, including those by David, ultimately went back to reflect on King Saul. 
Yet Saul was unable to celebrate those victories. He was unable to derive pleasure from his accomplishments. Why? Because he was so jealous of David. And then finally, Saul's jealousy gradually eroded the remnants of virtue in his own character. I mean, Saul not only threw spears at David, he sought to have him killed by the Philistines when he offered his daughter's hand in marriage. He even tried assassinating David while he was sleeping. But fortunately, uh, Saul's daughter, his new bride, helped David escape unarmed or unharmed. Saul continued tracking and hunting David down when he was in the run. You can read it in chapters 19 through 23. All in all, Saul tried to murder David six different times in those chapters. Plus, he used the Israelite army as a means to his own end to carry out this personal vendetta against David. I mean, Saul completely lost all positive character attributes because that bitterness and jealousy just took over in his life. So sad. When David eventually fled from King Saul's presence, he left alone. He didn't take any, uh, anyone with him. He didn't leave with a core of loyal followers. He didn't seek to discredit or, or uh, malign the very man who wanted him dead. He went to see the prophet Samuel, uh, and, and, and then Saul sent men after him there. He then returned to meet with his best friend Jonathan, and that was the moment that we talked about last week the last time that they saw each other as friends. Then David was back on the run again, first in Israel, then in the land of Gath, where Goliath had grown up in. And just as I mentioned, Saul's sending wave after wave of soldiers and armies out to try to track David down all throughout this time. What's interesting, though, David uh, starts moving around in the caves in the, in the Engedi region that we talked about, and people started finding him. I mean, this was way before Twitter. I don't know how word got out, right? Like, David checking into the caves in En and we're like, oh, let's go see what, no, I, we don't know, but word got out. 1 Samuel 22, 1-2 says this. David left there and escaped to the cave of Adulam, where his brothers and all of his father's house heard of it. They went down there to him, and everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him. And he became captain over them. Those who were with him numbered about 400. So all sorts of uh, uh, misfits, fugitives, discontents, and, and assorted ruffians somehow find David and figure life is better when they're around him. And so he becomes their unofficial leader. Did he ask for this? Did he put an ad in the paper uh, saying looking for a few, you know, a few good men? No. They just found him. And he didn't share any of their attributes as well. But what's interesting, the more they spent time around David, the more they changed. Their character began to reflect the attitude of their leader, David. They began to clean up their outward lives. And then their inward lives began to change as well. And David's true kingship began to take root there in the wilderness of the En Gedi Caves. Now, David and his men were forced to live on the run because Saul continued to track them down. Eugene Peterson writes this, everybody, at, at least everybody who has anything to do with God, spends time in the wilderness. Right? The years that David spent living in the wilderness taught him about truth and beauty and love. Those were the years that David knew he was not in control of his life, right? He had no assignments, no appointments to keep. His only task was to stay alive. Stay alive. Stay alert. The scriptures record 15 different stories that happened to David and his men when they're in the wilderness during this season. Eugene Peterson puts it this way. David started out running for his life, and at some point, he found the life he was running for. And the name for that life was God. God is my refuge. I think, friends, sometimes we find ourselves uh, starting out desperate in the wilderness of the En Gedi, when it, whatever that is in our lives, right? We panic. We don't know what's going to happen. How are we going to survive? Well, where will we go? What will we do? And in that moment, if we stay there, we may find that we become ecstatic in the love and grace of God 
there in that very wilderness that we were seeking to avoid. You see, David wasn't truly running from Saul. He was running to God. There's a big difference, right? Running from someone or something and running to God. David was finding himself in God's presence there in the wilderness, wide-eyed in wonder, taking in the glory, awake and ready for God's generous love. And it changed his life. It gave him the foundation to be the king that would become one of the greatest kings in the history of all Israel. Now, near the end of chapter 23, Saul almost catches up to David. But at the last moment... In the Greek uh, drama, they called it a deus ex machina moment. The god of the machine would come and would change something right at the very end. At the very moment, uh, Saul receives a letter that the Philistines are making a raid on the land. And literally, he was right around the corner from where David was hiding. And they leave to go deal with the Philistines. And it's that close call that David moves his men to those caves in the En Gedi that we saw at the beginning. For Samuel 24, 1 to 2, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, that little side route that diverted him away from David, he was told David is in the wilderness of the En Gedi. Saul then took 3,000 chosen men of all of Israel and went to look for David and his men in the direction of the rocks of the wild goats, which brings us right back here. David and his men hiding out in the darkness, trying to stay alive to stay one step ahead of Saul. And then everything changes. Verse 3 and following. Saul came to the sheepfolds beside the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of that very same cave. The men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord has said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. So are you, are you getting the picture of what's happening here, right? Saul hears, shall we say, the call of nature, right? And when you got to go, you got to go. So he leaves the soldiers. He wanders into a cave to take care of business. And anyone who's ever gone from a very bright spot into a very dark spot knows that it takes a while for your eyes to adjust, right? So Saul literally has no idea what he's walking into. He just knew that he had to go. So David and his men, they've been in the back of that cave for a while. Their eyes were completely adjusted. They could see everything clearly. And this is just what they had hoped for, a chance to get back at the very person who was causing their lives such incredible pain and struggle. And so the men encouraged David, yeah, I think it's time for you to take care of a little business yourself right here. You know what I mean? Right? He's there for the picking. Verse 4. Then David went and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. Afterward, David was stricken to the heart because he had cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to to raise my hand against him. So David scolded his men severely and did not permit them to attack Saul. Then Saul got up and left the cave and went on his way. So with Saul standing there literally before him, or possibly squatting, we don't know, David has the perfect opportunity to rid himself once and for all of this troublesome king. And he could have cut off quite a bit, right? Like he could have cut off Saul's life or future or throne, could have cut off some body parts if he wanted to, who's saying, right? But David instead cuts off a corner of Saul's cloak, and that's it. And then immediately... The narrator says he regrets it. Why? David's time in the wilderness taught him to look at things differently. I mean, in the darkness of that cave, David was the only one who didn't see an enemy before him. David saw a a magnificent, albeit deeply flawed, man of God. God's chosen and anointed one, and David would not fight back. As Gene Edwards puts it, it was as if David was saying to his men, better he kill me than I learn his ways. Better he kill me than than I become as he is. I shall not practice the ways that cause kings to go mad. I will not throw spears, nor will I allow hatred to grow in my heart. I will not avenge. I will not destroy the Lord's anointed. Not now, not ever. 
This is just another example of how David, we see, is far more fitting to be king of Israel than Saul ever was. Right? There's a, there's a big difference between that outward expression of power when you have authority and, and position, even position that's given by God, and the inward filling of the spirit in a person's life. Right? Saul had the former for, for a while. Right? He was God's chosen. He was the first king. But despite all that power, it never changed his heart on the inside. Gene Edwards says, God sometimes gives unworthy vessels a greater portion of power so that others will eventually see the true state of internal nakedness within that individual. The Bible says the gifts of God, once given, cannot be recalled even as this story says, in the presence of sin. So I invite you to to read through, if you don't want to read 19, chapters 19 to 24, at least read chapter 20 through 24 and see how this story unfolds. It's a wonderful description of this verbal back and forth between Saul and David once Saul leaves the cave. And and suffice it to say that in a moment of unparalleled lucidity, Saul recognizes, at least for that moment, that his time as king will be coming to an end soon, and that David is the rightful heir to the throne. But I want to go back to something that Gene Edwards said, that idea that God may give unworthy vessels a greater portion of power so that others may eventually see their internal nakedness. Now, the danger, of course, in a great quote like that is us trying to determine who is more holy or unholy than others. But as Edward says, the problem is none of us can tell who the Lord's anointed is and who isn't. Only God knows and God isn't telling. But, Edward says, if we look close enough, we will just find that King Saul actually lives inside each of us. There's that way of King Saul that grows in our hearts and will continue to grow unless we crush him, unless we try to have a heart like David's, who had a heart after God's own heart, one that welcomes challenges, even the challenges of suffering. David willingly embraced the brokenness. He didn't understand it. He didn't know where it was heading. It didn't make sense in all the things that had come before, but he embraced it. He welcomed it. He went to see where it was that God was leading him through it all. The question is, can we do the same? Can we have that same kind of heart? It's scary because brokenness is all around, and we don't want to embrace that. We don't want to welcome that. Brokenness, often we think it indicates weakness. But no, in this story, we're reminded that brokenness leads to humility and submission. And if we allow God to work in our lives, we will be changed and made stronger along the way. It's not an easy lesson to learn. It may very well lead us into the wilderness, into some very dark caves, but it may also lead us to the place where God can do his best work in our lives if we will let him. May we have the courage to face these challenges. May we not be people who throw spears or return spears that have been thrown against us in the way of King Saul. May we have a heart like David's, who was a man after God's own heart. And all God's people said, amen, amen.